Oh, wait, I can't let you unmute. I'm not the host anymore. Oh, no. I can unmute them. No, it's, it's, hey, AJ, hey, Charlie. Oh, my God, so many great people. We got two Joshes here, two Josh Bears. I mean, there's Darlene. Hey, Darlene. Wow, cool. Nice full class. Um, Hey, Scott. Scott Stippling's here. Stripling, sorry. Um, oh, hey, Scott. Oh, yeah, I don't think we've ever met person to person. Mose is here. Great. Um, people can say hi in chat. Nice. Is that your cat? Oh, yeah. She's going to be a big part of this. <laughs> Azita. Yeah, I let my dogs out right before uh, this started. So like, as soon as I start talking, they'll definitely start barking and want to go out again. Yeah, I've got my, well, I use her cat stand as a, as a tripod sometimes. It's just the right length. And so she's, she's on it right now, guarding her thing. But I'm going to like pick that up later and use it as a tripod. Come on, can you come up here? Oh, hey, Scott, um, you know, I think everybody's mute. Everybody's muted just for, uh, um, so you don't have to go. Josh, I had to leave and come back too. It oh, that's weird. Yeah, we, we can hear you. Yeah, we, because, we, yeah, but at first, when I first came on, I had to sign off because it told me it doesn't support my audio. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm on Zoom every day. I had to sign anybody, off and back on. Can anybody not hear us? Hello, hello, hello. Oh, my audio is not working. Okay, okay. No, you're fine. We totally but no, no, I'm Scott was saying his audio isn't working. I'm sorry. Uh -oh. Cool. Craig Bostick, it says you're Tom Hart. You got to change that, man. <laughs> you got to sign in with your own. <laughs> Can you see it? Okay, Goofy. Okay, okay Goofy. There's Beth. There's Maya. Can't tell if Michael Ashner is really here or not. He's supposed you know, to. Do you know if we have, um, do we have kids in the class, Tom? I'm trying to wonder how, how PG we should keep it. Um, I don't know that. I, people can um, post in the chat if there is a kid. I don't, I don't. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think we tried to keep it PG, but I think some odd Aubrey Beardsley stuff sneak <laughs> oh, way in. Definitely some not PG stuff that I put in. That is not going to be a problem. I can like uh, go past it real quick if anybody. Is Martha here? Oh my! I was I was teaching today, and I was telling a student about Renee French's grip bath, and they're like, "Oh, I know Renee French." And then I showed her grip bath, and she was like, "What the bath?" <laughs> she was like, "This is really different." And it's strange because it's like Renee French is, you know, they talk about the frog like slowly being like dipped into the boiling water and the temperature slowly rising. Like right. I've seen Renee French's work more, meta, you know, change over like the course of 31 years. And it's really, it's shocking when you go back and look at grip bath and you see how different it is. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So Dave Hotstream's here. Hi, Dave. How you doing? I think I think the one we clicked on, there was like a father and his son was in a bunny suit and they were like, we're gonna go have sex in the living room. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, um, and I said to my student, like, oh yeah, she was a little bit more of an edge ward back then. She was like, well, I like edge wards. <laughs> I like this kind of edge ward, she said. I only <laughs> I only heard that term recently. I'm pretty slow. <laughs> I don't even know if the term's like valid anymore. Oh, really? Yeah, mm. if I've heard it. It's probably no longer valid. There's a there's stuff I'm constantly looking up, and there's stuff I I'll learn and then I'll forget. Like based, I I, <laughs> I, looked, I looked it up like two years ago, and I was like, oh, that's a it's a good term, and now I can't remember <laughs> if it's if it's positive or negative. I had to look up simp. Simp's a good word. <laughs> I, I don't know what any of these things are, nor how to spell them or anything. All right. Hi, Steve Baker. Nice to see you. Hi, good to see you. Yeah. Good to see you.
Dude. You guys, it's really funny because we're, we, I got to monitor the number of participants because if it gets closer to 100, I got to go in and up our Zoom account really fast because no we're kidding. at the Huh? Oh, yeah. no, no kidding. Wow. Yeah. What, kind of, what kind of Zoom account do you have? Uh, well, it's, I mean, pro. pro. Yeah. But, you know, Zoom is really weird. It's like you can like change to a different plan or you can just buy for even more money a bunch like the ability to have more participants, which it might come to, but if it, if it goes past 90, I'll do it. But right now we're at 60. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to be constantly to... like looking down, up, but down, up. I told no, Tom to tell me it was just going to be six people. So there'd be like, no. Oh yeah. I wasn't supposed to say that. No, all these people are just, um, illusions. They're fake news, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I know I am. Um, <laughs> It is a. Uh, it is eight oh four. Should we start? Should we like? Yeah, yeah. Introduce us. Let's get to it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'll I'll get to it. Um, okay, and yeah, I'll just be watching. I, them. I didn't mean it like that. I said let's get to it. <laughs> let's, let's, let's play ball. Just <laughs> punk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We're nice people. There's no rules. Um, all right. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, it's really great. I'm really honored that Hyena and Josh asked me to do this. Um, if you don't know um, where you are, well, you're probably in a chair in your house or something, but um, <laughs> virtually you're at the Sequential Artist Workshop, which um, has which is uh, has lots of courses and, and online community and big programs and little snippets and things for people doing comics. Um, and I hope um, I hope you'll explore a little more. Um, I'll post some links in the chat or something. And um, Hina and Josh also were thinking about doing this, extending what would they do today in the future. So if they do that, it'd be it'd be through that. Uh, it'd be through Saw. So we definitely want to know if you guys are interested in doing more. Um, uh, I don't have much to say except thanks. I will, again, I will, I'll post some links in the chat window. That'll be kind of annoying, but I adore both these people. I haven't seen you guys. I think SPX, you know, whenever they had one was the last time I saw you. Um, so a year and a half ago. Yeah, right. Well, and, a year and, and a half. Yeah. And it's still up in the air about whether or not there'll be one this year. It's like really close to the wire, right? Um, so I hope I get to stand next to you guys at a table in same September. Yeah. So next year in Bethesda, as they say. <laughs> next year. That's what we were saying at Passover for sure. Um, all right, cool. I'm just gonna hand it over to you. You guys do um, do whatever you want. I'm gonna be scribbling along with everybody else and also monitoring the the door. We got 74 people, so that's super good. Um, but if it goes higher, I'm gonna be like panicking and getting out my credit. Stuff. Um, oh, no. It's really wonderful to have everybody, people who are here from Hyena's Instagram and people who are here from Josh's Instagram and maybe even Josh's teaching and stuff and people who are here from from the Saw stuff that has been going on the past couple of years. And I, I'm just really glad to be able to mix it up like this. And I really appreciate um, everybody being here, especially Hyena and Josh. Thank you. Okay. That's the official now. That's the official handoff. Okay. Go. Oh, great. Hey, um, I'm going to start. Hey, everybody, welcome. Um, I'm Josh. Um, she, uh, this is Becky. Um, or oh, actually, Becky Hyena. Or do you care? I, I prefer Hyena. Hyena is my professional name, but the fact that Becky is my real name is not a secret, a dark secret. A dark. So um, I'm going to, I usually try to, you know, when I lecture, I try to make it really interactive. And Tom, thank you again so much for having us do this. I'll tell, I'll tell you all later about how much, how I owe my whole teaching career to Tom. So um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen and I'm going to ask you to do a, you can take some notes at the beginning of the course. And this is something that I came up with that should appeal to people, whether they've done hundreds of pages of comics or whether they've never done one before. Uh, often a comic can be almost like a, you know, think about Harvey Picard just coming straight out, introducing himself and saying, this is a comic about me. You can write a comic as an essay. You can write a comic as a um, like a little play with characters in it. And the theme of this little short comic should be how I am punk or why am I, why am I punk? Why, why I am punk. So it can be a statement. It can be a, uh, an anecdote. So I'll go ahead and read it. 
Hi, everyone. For tonight, we'd like everyone to ask themselves the question, the musical question, why am I punk? Can also be rephrased as how am I punk? Am I punk? Or I'm punk because? This question can mean a lot of different things to people. It can mean a transformation and change. Ian Mackay once said that as a teenager viewing the world through the eyes of a skateboarder, that was his earliest brush with experiencing the transformation of the everyday world. The features of society were repurposed. The loathing ramp or a parking lot was now an obstacle course for kids. This license to be creative and to redefine the repurpose the everyday was a beacon that guided him as he forged the youth movement and helped to contribute to, to help contribute to a musical genre. For another group, it might mean a commitment to political ideals. And, in, and for another, it's simply a cultural and musical aesthetic. For other people, the very language I used above might be too boring to be appropriately punk. For some, uh, punk is a rejection of institutional language. So everyone in this meeting has some passing relationship to punk at least. As a writing a drawing prompt, I want you to ask yourself, how am I punk? And do a short narrative or an essay about this notion using some of the tips we'll give you in class. Maybe the way you are punk is the way you cook. Maybe it's the way you use your climbing gym or the way you decide to relate to people around you. Maybe it's tied into your greatest achievement. Like I went back to school at age 40 because it's punk, man. Or the way you are motivated to practice activism. Maybe it simply means you always wanted to be Gary Panther. The comic can be funny. It can be tragic or simply straightforward and blunt. It can be off, can run off on a tangent. No one but you would expect uh, it's a prompt, so what you do with it, do with it is up to you. Uh, you may not finish it now, but you may later. And when you do, please post the work on Instagram. And I'm going to post all these on my teaching page, Josh Bear Teaching, but also tag um, Hyena and Sequential Arts Workshop. So I mentioned up here tips. For me, I always go back to the tips of like how to draw. And was what to me that is. I didn't come out of the egg like knowing how to render. It was like a long, hard won process of trying to gather skills because I, I used to draw in a very kind of spazzy way. Um, so I'm gonna show you really quickly what I did to, with my, last night I sat down and I did a couple of, um, I executed this, this uh, I executed this exercise and I'll share that with you. And then I'll have Becky share hers and then we'll trade off giving different tips. Second, hopefully this works. I'm gonna share, yeah. <laughs> so, this is my first pass at the assignment. Um, I am into punk because I've been listening to punk since I, uh, since 1987, when I bought the Gun Club's uh, Las Vegas story. Then down here, I know all the lyrics of the Rollins Band's Hard Volume album. And then finally, lately, I've been listening to a lot of old school country but I'm still listening. I'm still listening to it for the same reasons. And I'm still punk. Uh, it's still punk to me and I'm still a punk rocker. So that was one version. That's one definition of how I'm into punk. And then here's another one that's a little bit more like I'm punk because I was predispositioned towards being maladjusted. I had a, you know, I had an upbringing. My mom died when I was a kid. My household was an abusive night vice about around my neck. I spent a year in a behavioral camp for troubled teens. I've had to fight or run my whole life. And that's why I'm punk or am I a poser? So that was my two different, you know, two totally different approaches. I think they're both kind of funny. They're both kind of straight. Like you're not really sure what to make of them. And as you can see, it's a con this is how I've always drawn. I like drawing really fast and scribbly. But those of you who know me know I also do stuff that's pretty tight. Um, and both approaches are okay. I'm going to switch over to Becky and she's going to talk and uh dovetail from talking about becky you could go like right either from your punk comic into um yeah i think i'll just go uh straight to punk comic i've gotta make my gotta find my ipad or no you okay if you need another minute host right do you need yeah let me know if you need a minute 
No, I've got everything set up. I just need, uh, I think I need you to make my other screen to make it screen the host so I can screen share with it. Oh, no, I or didn't. Can... Have... Yeah, we didn't you have to be able... remember. Oh, shoot. Okay, yeah. Sorry, Josh is a lot. The there we go. Josh is a lot uh, more fluent in uh, Zoom than me. Mm -hmm. So I apologize in advance to everybody. Uh, that'll probably take me a couple more seconds to do these transitions. And there we go. No apologies. That's good. All right, there we go. That's the ticket. So this is, uh, Josh's looks a lot better than mine, but I thought when I was doing this for kind of a screen test today that it would be cool to have something that was more in progress to show, uh, which is why I said this is a test. And um, so this is starting off with pencils. This is my comic. Um, I always felt I didn't belong in the world. Punk made me more empowered in my outsider status and gave me a code of ethics. Made me realize nothing could stop me from finding a way to make my own world. I actually did a long comic about this last year. So this is just paraphrasing, which I did um, for the upcoming bird, not to plug like, hey, go buy this book, but the birdcage uh, bottoms at punk anthology. It did uh, this is why I'm punk kind of 24 page thing. So this will just get into inking this um, and kind of while I'm doing it, talk about some things um, like I'm much more linear and see I'm almost kind of mm -hmm. like color by numbers inking this, but uh, then some of Josh's stuff where, which is why it's cool when we work together because I feel like he's got a more painterly um, kind of approach to building images and I'm very much just uh, mm -hmm. straight linear, but. Hey, hey, Becky, interrupt real quick. Did you want to press time lapse? It's not on. Oh, shoot. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Perfect. And hit the red button. There you go. There you go. Right. That zooms in too. We can see it better. Cool. Yeah. Like I said, I'm not as good uh, with the zoom stuff. I love that character sitting on Saturn or whatever. Yeah, it's kind of like um, trying to, uh, I try when I'm doing these kind of more like, it's almost like this, you're right. These kind of comics, you're not showing action so much as you're illustrating ideas. So you try to like show more in the picture than the text has. It's gonna go ahead and man out these borders so y'all can possibly actually see them. Um, let's see if I can get this real quick so I can show you some like, you know, more sexy like rendering or like this is how this stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm a pretty like systematic as far as inking goes where I'll like not, you know, which maybe is unpunk, but it's like, now I'll do all of this part. Now I'll do all of this part. Now I'll do all of this part. But the part um, that I think like where punk really comes into informing how I make these comics and make these images is it's kind of like, I don't let myself be precious or perfectionist about it. Like this is uh, obviously not the best comic I've ever made, but like whatever, we're rolling with it. Um, and I also don't go back a lot of times and like try to make things better after I've done them. It's like, I look at it kind of like a musical performance or if you're like more of a jock, uh, <laughs> I'm a closet jock, that's a secret of mine, <laughs> is a, uh, you know, you get like one shot and as long as you don't leave anything on the field, uh, like the jocks say, you know, as long as you go out there and you do something and you do it as best as you can do it, there's nothing to be ashamed of and there's nothing to like, so I know some people that are like super embarrassed of like their old work, so it doesn't like look very good. And I'm like, whatever, that's 
the best I could do at the time. And, you know, I tried my hardest, so there's nothing to be ashamed of. Um, and I'll just do better the next time. But see here, um, this is kind of like more of a, uh, the style that I'm doing currently, which is uh, more heavily like just black and white with not very much rendering going on. Um, and I'll do this one a different way just to kind of give a, uh, again, trying to do it a little bit faster. You know, what did it mean? Cause I'm not a jock when you said, uh, don't leave the don't leave anything on the field exactly yeah uh it means you know like you go out and you try like you don't leave any effort you know you don't like you leave your heart every out there. action you take everything you, you know you go hard and you go as hard as you can to where you know like you're coming off of the field or you know like after you play a show or after you do anything in your life, like when you walk away from it, you've given it every single thing that you could possibly give it to the point of being like spent to the point of, you know, you have no more effort. Um, so for me, it's just like, if you're gonna, if something's worth doing, it's worth doing right, which is something my grandmother used to say a lot. Um, so it might be like punk colluding with like Midwest Western German farm ethic. Uh, but it's, um, yeah. And so if, if I'm going to do something, I'm not going to half-ass it. I'm going to do it the best that I can, um, or it's not really worth doing at all is I guess the way I interpret that. But that is, that's not the only way to approach, you know, it's like if every single comic artist was like, I'm never ever going to edit any comics that I do. Like if I don't do it perfect, the first time, you know, that's as like, you know, that's as terrifying to some people as like having to endlessly rework something is to me. It's, um, you know, just different kinds of approaches for different people. All right, but as you can see, I'm doing uh, some, already made some like little marks there. And this is kind of more how I used to draw using more hatching and contour. And so you can see you can kind of curve, and make it a little bit thicker. So Hyena, it doesn't have to be perfect, but you have to give it your all. Is that sort of what you're saying? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, no such thing as perfect, but like, you know, as long as you did your best, nobody can ask you to do better than that. Um, and that's nothing to be ashamed of. And so I don't go back and rework. I'd rather put my energy towards the next thing I'm doing than, um, you know, it's about, it's where an urgency of expression for me trumps perfection or trumps, um, okay, let's pretend I just drew off the page. That's how, that's how I am. Awesome. Yeah, so they're just like real quick, different kind of like, mm -hmm techniques of awesome. making that happen. <laughs> the scribbling top you're leaving, it's leading from your pen is so good. Cool, you wanna, I'll, I, I'll take over then? Yeah, why don't you do it for a while and we'll continue going back and forth. Okay. So I feel like, you know, I could just like ramble while I'm drawing, but I could also draw while you're rambling. So for people who um, are trying to kind of break the ice and get themselves to do comics who don't, who um, it's more of an ambition that's something they've really started to do regularly, I want to give you a couple of tips that um, help me. I feel like I have to kind of, I often have to kickstart um, myself into doing work. It's one of the things I like about teaching is that it gets me really excited about whatever I'm showing other people. So, um, and, and sometimes it's like, I'll do something. It's a lot simpler. It's so like, I get so in my head that sometimes a simple prompt that I'm forcing somebody else to do will get me interested in that prompt. Okay, All right, so while Becky was talking, I did, and by the way, let me know if my voice gets really watery. Um, sometimes people will, there'll be an issue when I'm pushing around my, 
laptop and using my other device that my thing will get all, uh, my voice will sound like it's underwater. So I, I was inspired by what Becky did and I started thinking of a third comic I could do. And I did a little image myself on a planet just like she did. Now, one good way to start a comic, if you, like a lot of us get very hung up on, you know, the fact that you have to rule in the borders, you can simply take a sheet of paper like this and fold it four times and then unfold it. Because like I said, it's important sometimes to trick yourself into working. And there's something, what a good comic page, uh, like, a Jack, like Jack Kirby, who would do very symmetrical grids, you could argue that even before you start drawing, there's something beautiful about four even frames. And you have this without having to get hung up on using a ruler, I have a guide I can draw, I can follow by doing this. Another thing you could do is draw two squares like this, and then that suggests the other. So if in the first frame, this guy is pondering how am I punk, the second frame, I, only, I don't have, they call this a floating vignette, I think, um, where they don't have a border. It's definitely suggested that there, this is where the edge of the frame would be, but I've only had to draw two frames, but I've really created four. It makes it a lot easier. So um, I have, like I've said before, I have a lot of different types of lines that I do. I did this image while I was looking at um, uh, Ken Landgraf's work, where I noticed that Landgraf gets away with doing big heavy blacks in the middle of the form. And that really doesn't, it doesn't really make sense at first glance. And most of us are taught like the shadows are gonna be over on the right or the left. And then you see a lot of cartoonists will do, find an excuse to do a big heavy black right in the middle of the form. With Landgraf, I feel like he understands that the muscles kind of weave around the body. So they don't just go straight down, they come at angles, they braid a little bit. And that's kind of all he has to know is that on the forearm, I have a, a big muscle that actually attaches here on the, where the radial bone is. And it's gonna twist all the way around here and go terminate up by my elbow. Sometimes it pops out a little bit. Another muscle that's very similar is on the inner thigh. You have a kind of a wedge here. There's the groin. And if this person is slightly at the left, I'll have a line here and here on the inside. That's another great place that gives an excuse to have, well, it's a muscle. So there might be a little shadow that gets caught up in its various pieces. So it's probably more obvious to do a shadow with the knee. And most of us are aware that you can do a curve on the side of the calf. Well, that gives me another excuse to do a big heavy black here in the middle of the form. Uh, another one up here where the shoulder is. And then again, the, the bicep is a lot like the calf muscle. Even if you're not a master of anatomy, you probably have, um, there's a good chance you, you've experimented with doing just a nice little curve like this. But these are the ones that are more kind of knit into the fabric of how the body works. And you know, then you can have these curves on the shirt. I read once in the Kirby Collector, those of you who know Jack Kirby's work, um, they broke down, oh, here, on this image as well, I did big heavy blacks in the middle of the leg. Now this one doesn't even make sense, but I don't care. I know that I'll, I'll figure out a rationale for having put it there later, but more importantly, it gave me a chance to, on this image, which is mostly, you know, so like delicate outlines, I've let, let myself go in and do these big curves, these big kind of teardrop shapes. What I usually do is I feather them after the fact. So don't be afraid to do this, or it looks like a comma. I'm gonna leave that one, I like it. But I usually have a little bit of feathering on it as well. Now I'm a real spaz because like I said, this is the way I normally draw, it's very different. So I like to draw very carefully and I like to just kind of, kind of attack the page. But then the problem with attacking the page is only you go so far with it and then you can't keep on building. So when I look at my old sketchbooks from 20 years ago, it's just, they're not fun to look at because I would only do like a burst of energy and get some marks down and I wouldn't be able to build. Now, when I look at my sketchbooks, I see a lot of illusions of depth. And I used to say, oh, I don't care about, I used to kind of 
justify that I didn't care about those things, but I really, really was fascinated with how even abstract expressionists, you can see their sketchbooks and see that they would really be invested in creating those illusions of depth. And Pollock even had sketchbooks full of, you know, in the past where he was trying to really master form. So um, back to Kirby. Jack Kirby, for those of you who know his work, he would do an arm and I read once in the Kirby collector that if you think about the way he did his arms, he would do, he would tend to do a big gouge like this of black on one side and then another one and then a smaller one, a little bit of feathering in the middle and then he returns to these big slabs of black over here on the other side. And this writer, I don't know if anybody's familiar with this article, but they were saying, they were arguing that what this really does is it's more like a minimalist version of what quote unquote real shading is. With real shading, more organic, like more natural shading, you might have some feathering that comes up like this and you have some gray and then you have another tone like this. And then it peters off. And this is something you might see in a more naturalistic looking painting. Here, I'll do a hand really quickly here. So you usually have a dark tone and then a gray tone. If I was to break down what I just drew here, you can identify a mid gray here and a very dark black here. So what they were saying is that Kirby would do a blob and your brain kind of connects this little piece that's breaking off of this, just like your brain understands that we do a slow bit of feathering it's you're slow, you're, you're, I'm slowly guiding your eye from understanding that we're deep in the recesses of the shadow. And then we're going off and it's getting lighter and lighter and lighter until we come to the light. So this much quicker does that. And then a little line here continues to take your eye around the form. So it's a little bit like a carousel. You go 300, you go all the way around the form with your eyes taking a little stop on each little fragment. And this starts to look really 3D. So that's a long-winded way of saying there's excuses you can find for putting weird blobby black shadows over a form. So let I, I want to keep drawing, but let me, um, we put together this uh, presentation. I'm going to show you a few different examples of different people and their different weird approaches to, to doing art. Um, so uh, where'd my window go? One second. Doing a booth talk. Uh... Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I totally lost this window. I'm gonna try that again. Share screen. All right, one more time. There we go. Oh. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> did you add more stuff too? I did. Awesome. <laughs> but the first thing I wanted to show you all. So this is Frida Kahlo from her sketchbook. And this, this image was a real revelation to me when I saw it because I just kind of, I had gone to art school when I was 18 and I dropped out and all the basic first year stuff stuck with me. And most of us have that experience where you go into a class and you're, taught to do a cylinder like a candle or a bowl or something and the teacher will set up a light source coming from over here so you start to get it into your head that oh, okay I get it if I do shadow if I do shadow then I have to have a light side and a shadowed side but then what about all the instances where it's an overcast day you don't have a shadow on both sides so isn't it possible that you might have I'm sorry you don't have a shadow just on one side you might have it on both sides Sometimes you get a shadow just because something's turning a little bit around and as it's getting around, as, as it's going around, you see a little glimmer of darkness on either side. So this one is kind of doing that, but it's also just doing her own thing. I remember just being baffled at how she could have a shadow on the left here and then a shadow here on the left. And well, I guess it looks, it actually does make sense, but there's also a shadow on the right. Uh, the way that I uh, a lot of times approach shadow is not 
necessarily where a light source is coming from, but rather as an element of design in order to mm. make the form stand out and from objects around it and from the background and from overlapping. And so a lot of times, like if you look at the shadows, they don't make sense for a light source, but they make the form really emerge. And I think that's one of the things going on with that one right there. I think that I think the majority of the shadows have to make sense and then you can kind of deviate. Yeah. Um, there's also what you call like, you know, there's there's like regional shadows, you know, this makes sense the shadows here because one foot is probably casting a shadow just like so yeah and this is very similar to the Kirby technique where your brain your eye kind of stops off on the middle and it lets you know this is something that's able to go you know it's got 360 degree circumference but this one was really this image in particular really made me rethink how to do shadows and this is full of different examples of people Durf's a great example early Durf and and current derp is a great example of somebody who understands shadows, but at a little at some point, it's a little bit like, go to hell, I'm gonna do this however I want. He also gets away of doing big grooves of black in the middle, just in the middle of the form. Yep. Second back, I'm gonna take it. Oh, and this is land graph I talked about before. So when you look at uh, Thor's arm, there's a lot of these shapes that look like commas. It's a combination of a big black blob and feathering. And right here, those forms take your, your eye all the way around the circumference of this forearm, just like with the Frida Kahlo image, those little random black blobs take your eye around it. This is one that we did together. I, I penciled this and he inked it. I'll come back to this stuff. There we go. Um, Becky, you want to talk about this stuff? I want to talk about, um, yeah, I wanted to have uh, this in here because it's more like how I do shadows, um, which what he does, you can see in these originals better. Uh, if you can blow that up just a little bit. On the, one, on the right or the left? On the right. Yeah, where you can see where it's all, um, all the shadowed areas are kind of more like paint by number, um, you know, like if they're drawn in, it's drawn in where the shadows are going to be and then he goes and fills it in as opposed mm -hmm. to these more kind of like um, painterly kind of like st brush strokes or because um, it's, it's not quite geometric, it's contoured. Um, and the shadows are describing things and it has that kind of abstract quality, but it's just a different way of thinking about shadow. Um, so I wanted to throw those in there because it's more on my brain wavelength. Do you think that he probably, so you were talking before about how you don't, I think that these guys developed this professional practice that they would do a full line drawing put down their old pen, thin pen and pick up their brush and they do the stuff in organized stages. Exactly. I think they're all type, type yeah. A personalities. What do you yeah. think? I think they're all type A personalities in that way. Oh, definitely, yeah. What, what yeah, about you? Not, like I said, like that's how I work and I know I am, like so. It's a very, uh, very like type A. I mean, you, you know, you're like, how long have we known each other? <laughs> what kind of personality I have. I thought you were adding some of the heavy blacks kind of in the middle and then going back to the line. No, no, it's almost mm. uh, like, that's why I call it paint by numbers. Um, I see. Because it's like, I do the pencils and then I do the line work and then I like color everything in. Um, this thing is, this wall, way you do this wall, he did this wall reminds me of you too. It's probably something I've stolen. <laughs> and then again, like the, yeah, the more kind of um, linear based where it's like colored in and you don't have a lot of like expressionistic marks. It's a very um, kind of like more design oriented mm. way of uh, thinking. What do you think he got the restraint not to, just to leave this form just most completely there's not even a even the slightest curve of shadow. He just completely held back. 
from doing that on her whole it's form. Really, really hard. Have you ever tried? <laughs> yeah, no. Like not even to do like one little thing. That's great the way that like it's um sorry, I'm just trying to point as if we're in real life, but the way that um her kind of uh serape or her like garment uh the does it, you know, like it's showing that it's folded just by showing how the design is folded. That's crazy. Yeah, it's really gorgeous. I mean, it's like a it's like math. Yeah, exactly. That's that's how I think about it for sure. Especially since Jaime sometimes would go the opposite route and have somebody wearing a plaid shirt and he wouldn't even try to conform it to the like he oh there's yeah, conforming to form, but sometimes it'll just do plaids and it's a flat pattern like I totally in that too because I find that it reproduces so much better. Like if you do mm -hmm. a contoured plaid shirt on eleven by seventeen, mm -hmm. that's one thing. You shrink it down to where that shirt prints. And it's maybe like one by one inch. And it, the readability is just so much better because you see it, you read it as a pattern and then you move on. It's not getting in the way of the information of the drawing. I wonder if we'll find one of those in here. He does it there, doesn't he? Look at that. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. But he definitely does it on, uh, especially later, he does it on Ray's uh, shirts a lot. Right there in that bottom left-hand corner, I think that guy's jacket is done that For way. sure, for sure. Um, this striped shirt too. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah, I, I'm still, like, they're also time-saving techniques, um, to be quite honest about it. Cause it's like one thing when you're doing like a drawing and you want everything to look as best as you can draw it. And mm -hmm. it's another thing when you're like, I have to do 50 pages of this character wearing a plaid shirt. I'm not drawing the contours of the plaid every single time. I say as a person who has done that and learned lessons. More Gilbert, the guy, this guy is here. I read this a long time ago, but I really, again, there's a real restraint in him him sticking to this design for the hair just like it's always one two or three really symmetrical areas of tone on it it's also interesting to see how over gilbert's career he went from doing a pretty thick line back to a medium line and then sometimes to a really thin line like he does here and sometimes both on the same page there's another plaid in the background so that figure this is oh the whole thing is a, a giant uh, i mean yeah i thought this was gilbert but there's that plaid. No, I see. Okay, it's both. Be that's my thought. Beto did the foreground, and Jaime did the background. I love this comic. This is one of my favorite Gilbert comics. It's but they're talking about um, talking about you good use of contour. Um, you know, with all those smaller lines on the figure that are kind of slightly curving up, they give it more of an impression where he's not really doing perspective, but you can tell that you're supposed to be looking from, you know, it's supposed to be a kind of worm's eye view where you're looking up. So that's, that's helping cool. give the illusion of, you know, space that wouldn't otherwise be there. I was listening to a Jim Shooter interview this week, if you, if you people know who he is, and he was complaining about Sal Buscema saying, you know, he'd do that worm's eye view so he wouldn't have to, it's a cheat, so I wouldn't have to deal with perspective. And I, um, I thought that was such a, it was such a weird, weird value to impose on him. It's a cheat to win, man. Like any, any. <laughs> like this, like, like this is easy to do because he didn't, I mean, he's doing it a lot here where he's not really dealing with a lot of challenging perspective. It doesn't get it, like, like this, it's a very flat image. It doesn't get in the way. I think it takes just as much attitude and charisma to make this work as it is to use perspective tricks as a as a tool. And also going back to what um, I was kind of saying about uh, punk mentality approaching comics, it's like if you wait until you can do a perfect like mm -hmm. you know three point perspective to like ever make a comic, and you're like, oh gosh, I can't do this comic I want to do because I don't think I can draw things in perspective well. And it's like, 
that's stupid. Just like do the comic that you can do using like the skills that you have and, you know, learn as you go. Like, don't wait to, till you know how to play guitar as good as the guys in Journey to like have a band, you know, like the end. <laughs> So I threw in Chester Gould. Now there's a lot of good, going back to the idea of like, how do you draw? How do you, how do you effectively, you know, use, uh, re repurpose these guys' techniques and make them your own. So I've been looking at a lot of Chester Gould this semester and he's, he's one of my favorite people to share with students because, and I'm gonna show you what he does in all of these frames. So at this point, Chester also, I mean, this guy could really render, you can see it here. When he has a chance to do repeated lines, he'll do them. But partially because of what Becky was, how, you know, was saying before about how things change when they get shrunk down, he's very conscious about the, the shrinking comics page and he wouldn't do a lot of feathering. He said in an interview once, uh, it, it just, it, it would, his, his beautiful lines would look like tiny little specks. Well, especially on newsprint. Yeah. So what he does, what you can see how the urge to render is underneath the surface. So when he, like, you can see the kind of, there's kind of a joy and these little twisting lines that show this beatnik kid's uh, greasy hair. But this is the real thing that I think is effective. So this is a trick that he did where he would add this shape that's always in the corners. It's often shaped kind of like this, like a weird like a pot of soup. Um, so really it's like two rectangles. Um, it's what he would do is you're drawing something and you want to give it depth, but you don't have time to, you don't have time and you don't really have room to do all the fussiness of creating a whole room. You do a black and then you render the edge just a little bit. And I found that I used to really search for, um, I used to really do a lot of repeated lines, try to do a lot of beautiful gradients. And lately I've been instead just doing a solid black, fill it in, make it airtight, have it go from corner to corner. And then at the edge, you just add a tiny bit of cross hatching. And when you add the cross hatching, you kind of experience it. You don't, you don't see this as an object. You understand the tone. And that's what he does up here. And it is, it's a real lifesaver for me when I'm doing comics. So, one sec, there we go. Uh, sometimes there's just a flat black and sometimes it's like he does here. The whole street is black and he just does a tiny bit of rendering. And it really does make you understand if you ran your finger across the surface, you get more of a sense of, of what that, what that con what the concrete would feel like. You get the texture and you get, you understand this isn't outer space, this is the ground. He does it here as well. So this is a great story. This guy, he's a doctor and he's, um, he, he's missing a hand and he secretly has a flamethrower in his coat. So of course, so of course Dick Tracy shoots, he, he starts shooting him and the guy runs into the street and he causes a gas truck to fall on its side and the entire street all goes into flames. And that's kind of a typical Dick Tracy happy ending. It's just pure chaos. But again, you can see how, look at these beautiful lines. Um, he really, when he has a chance to get in there and fling ink around, he really wants to do it. That hand, I want that hand, I love it. It's there in calm scenes. It's there as well. Look at how this room, this frame at the top, that yellow frame would be so static if it wasn't for that little bit of feathering that goes off to the black. And I found that, um, yeah, I, I found that uh, if, I, if I try to do that technique, it helps me get the tones that I want without endlessly rendering. And if I don't do it, I sort of just start end up building, I never know when to stop. This is a classic use of a razor blade um, you can always tell because the lines are a little bit a little bit bumpy. Often artists will do it with wind and motion, but it's pretty tell. Once you see this stuff in person, you'll be able to see the artists were using an exacto knife to get certain effects. You can see how you can always tell because the whites are 
you can see it being dragged over the surface. There again, I love this. So it's a snow, this is a, a bad guy is hiding out in a, the, the scoreboard of an abandoned football field or something or a soccer field. And look at the way that he did the landscape where the snow is. Again here, he just loves to do these lines. So what, another tip that I give my students is you wanna, I don't wanna go up onto this too much, but I, I spend a lot of time talking to my students about how these guys are great abstractionists. And one of the key things that they do is when they create curves or they create an organic effect, you try to ask yourself how many different types of lines you can put down how close you can make them and how there's not one line in the side of the tree, which is the same as any other. Some of them look like question marks or S's. Some of them, like this one is like a twisting S. This one's just almost like a, a straight, slightly curved dagger. This one's like a U. And I found that this really works for me. You guys do this again and again. When they do, the gouges in the snow were the same way. None of them are really the same length. Um, they're kind of going the same direction, but they're, some are medium, some are long, some are twisting, some are almost straight, some are really fat at the bottom. There's also a test to see how close you can make them together. And again, he's doing it with the water. And you can tell these lines are really fun to do. So let me share my other screen again real quick. I love how your pan is still there, your pot. Yeah, I'll get rid of it in a sec. Right. <laughs> Tom, do you have any idea why they stopped using the razors? They, they really seemed to abandon them in the early 80s. So it, has I think to it was really the early 80s? I don't know. I feel um, like um, like John it, Ramada it, used them. It hasn't, we've like tried to find out over and over again, and nobody really has like a definitive answer. I think I asked Al, Mil Al Milgram, who would know, and I don't think he had a really illuminating answer, but I like think- Like different uh, paper or just better- Better white out? Paint, yeah, yeah. white out or- um, That would be my guess, is that white out got better or, you know, although gouache has been around forever and hasn't changed much. Yeah, um, still perfectly. I don't know, I just thought people I, don't know, I just thought it fell out of favor or something. I used to, uh, because I have a printmate, I get, talking about type A uh, personalities, I have a printmaking background. And from additioning prints, I had it in my head that like I couldn't use whiteout on a comic page. Mm -hmm. Like, I, which now I'd like use it every time. It's like, wow, well, you know, I messed this up, you know, whatever. But like I had this block in my brain. So I'd take a tiny razor every time I made a mistake and like scratch the surface of the paper until the ink was gone and then redraw it. Oh, cool. Because like in printmaking, if you're doing like archival edition to prints, like you're printing it for an artist or something, like every single one has to, you know, you can't like, you get an ink smudge, you can't like erase it. Um, so you just have to like take the razor and like get it out and burnish the page down. And um, so, yeah, and then I somehow got over that and was like, oh wait, I can just use white out like a normal person. The end. So going back to what I was saying before, when I'm doing the little gouges, the fabric at the bottom of this guy's pants, all the lines are different. I try to test myself to see how close I can make them together. And this one is like this. This one is like twice as long. One of them might look like this. One of them might look like this. So it works with folds. It works with shadows. It works with um, textures. You saw before it worked with that tree. You know, you just had lines that were like this, but they were going a different direction. Some are like this. Some are like this with very much the same shape, but it's curving the other way. Some are dashes as you get closer to the edge, they might get more compressed together. Well, that if kind of works, sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna say that kind of with uh, whatever rendering technique that you're making, 
like if you make them get denser towards the edge of the object and then kind of feather out and making, you know, becoming lighter, um, you know, that works with hatching, that works with stippling, that works with um, totally. pretty much anything you're doing. So yeah, even here I'm having, I'm thinking about a gradient and thinking from big to small. So they're getting more compressed. And like I said before, I mean, my first impulse as an artist is just get in there and slash away at the ink and hoping I'm such a genius that it'll end up looking right. And you wanna have some of the energy, but it's, well, maybe you do, or, but it's really helped me to be able to calm down a little bit. And one of the ways I, and create order. And one of the ways I create order is talking, going into those sorts of systems, thinking about big to small, for example. Now we looked at, um, I was showing how we have those effects in the snow. I could do that. This guy's in outer space. I could have like space vapor in the background. And I'm thinking big, right? I'm doing these big syrupy lines that look like eels. And you don't want them to be too routine. You don't want them to be too predictable. So you keep on asking yourself, how can I make these different? So sometimes when I'm teaching, I'll ask my student, I'll go over a checklist with my students when they're doing this technique and I'll say, how, how close are the lines? How different? How different, do, how different are they shaped? How differently are they, are they going in different directions? So this one's kind of going up like that. This one might kind of seesaw down like that way. And even though these look like it's one kind of big syrupy gas cloud, which is going by, they're within that context, they're all going different directions, left, right, down the middle, kind of an electric line. Uh, have, I done any, have I done anything that's really fat? Am I getting into a, a rut where I'm not really playing with how close they can make them together? And another big thing I remind my students about is think about the edges. What happens in the edge of this glob, which is this glob is really careless. You can see by the way I'm doing it, I'm really just digging my pen in and trying to have fun with kind of pressing the line in uh, and making it sort of reckless and wild looking and dragging it out. But when it goes behind his shoulder, it's gonna come out the other side. And so it's, gonna, it's both gonna be really raw looking and it's also gonna stop on a dime. Then you can mix these techniques. So you see a little bit of the land graph Kirby blob inks here. You see a little bit of the Chester Gould system, and but so many other people have done it as well of differentiating the shapes of these abstract lines here. And then maybe I'll do a little bit of feathering, more traditional stuff. You can do one right over the other as well. Now, another thing that I like to do when I get stuck, and this was a this was, I, I, I did this one out of my head and it's cool and all, but this character really has like no face. I was tired when I did it. I was kind of thinking he looked like a kind of a, a half-assed Charlie Brown. When we look at, um, one second, let me get out of this window really quick. When I look at older artist stuff and I look at um, people like Chef for Gold, Okay, so you can see him just in the corner. I might notice things that I would have thought of otherwise. So one thing I like to, a, a trick that I learned at SVA was to look at, uh, look at other comics and kind of swap out elements of faces. So if I take like a quick look at like other people's work, um, Little Orphan Annie here. There we go. Um, my favorite, Harold Gray. I might have, I might design these faces differently. Every time they design a character, they have to give them a different face and the artists figure out kind of tropes they can use and reuse. And maybe if I'd looked at one of these, I might've said that I wanted this head to be more like, maybe more square with a shadow on the side. It still looks like an everyman the way I wanted him to. but it has a slightly different energy. I kind of like that. I might like that better. So I often will go in and redraw my, my stuff. This guy here, uh, it's a little bit off camera, but there's a guy who has a very, very tiny 
kind of little black head, little simple shaped head with black shadow on the side. So that's a few of my tips. Um, I'm gonna go one, so one, a lot of it has to do with appropriating stuff that I like in other people's work and really breaking down for myself how I think they, what I think is making them work. I'm gonna switch over and uh, let Becky talk. Good, uh... We were here. We want to look at. We had two um, new punk. Here we go. Okay, so I think you've got to scroll through these because it's still your screen, unless you want. Oh, new share. Okay, One second. I have. Uh, can... Or you, you can go ahead and do that because that way I don't have to like real quick find my Google Drive. Um, but yeah, that I, was just uh, Alexander Ayer um, does a lot of uh, New York um, punk posters. I don't know if he still does. He has a Death by Traders brand. Um, he makes a lot of merch now, but he uses a lot of like this kind of like stippling, kind of like uh, Russian prison tattoo looking mm -hmm. rendering stuff. And you can see how we were talking about earlier um, towards the edges of the figure, there's denser dots. And then as you get toward into the, um, like towards the center of his arm, for example, away from that edge uh, kind of feathers out. Um, but these images that I compiled have a few things in common um, or a few like themes that I think are punk. And you can keep on going through them, Josh. We uh, noticed yesterday this kind of, this design kind of looks like a, x-ray of a uterus <laughs> but i think like uh kind of like aggression um or at least like aggressive confrontational imagery is something that kind of like is a theme um very graphic um kind of images not graphic necessarily as in as explicit but taken from you know, things that are like means of communication, things that are like supposed to be on flyers or on t-shirts or like make you interested in this thing or easily communicate an idea like Nazis are bad, um, blah, blah, blah. Um, subversive appropriation, um, you can keep going through them. Well, I wanna say really quick too, um, this is another example, I love these little veins here that are coming out and I'm still working on my other image. Um, I could take these veins and put them onto uh, that character is on the little planet. It's another way I could do folds. I mean, these are so simply done and they're really beautiful and organized. And so all of these techniques can go well together. You might have a big gouge here and here and let me make this a little bit thinner. Do some of these things that look a little bit like veins and a little bit like tributaries in a body of water and put them in a new context. And I've quickly kind of mapped out a new form. Yeah, like any of this, uh, talking about appropriation, anything you can kind of like grab and be like, oh, like those characters uh, there, like I, I think he stopped using those because uh, they were kind of appropriation, but you know, just grabbing like, oh, this looks cool, this looks cool, this looks cool, I'm gonna throw all this together. Um, you can keep going through them, sorry. Don't say sorry. I feel like you're doing, uh, <laughs> you're like the slide projector. Uh, is another kind of like Pettibone-esque uh, artist. He's a tattoo artist, uh, Matt Curley. But you see a very like different kind of freer, more sinewy paintery lines um, and brush strokes and kind of that almost splashy looking stuff coming out of the cup. Um, I love her jaw. Yeah, it's like, that's kind of like that illusion of, it's kind of like old tattoo style, but like this illusion of like perspective uh, once again, where it's like not really in perspective, mm -hmm. but you know you're supposed to be looking up because of that, the way that line curves. Yeah, um, I'm that jaw. Some pretty, I think this was an album cover for a metal band, but um, some pretty brutal stuff. You know, next slide. 
the same guy. Uh, that's way more petty bone uh, looking, uh, especially with the uh, accompanying text, but it's a, di a different way of drawing. Uh, oop, you can go ahead. That's um, talking about appropriation. This is um, Jonathan Burney. Mick who, Burney. Uh, hmm? Mick Burney, you're right. His um, King of Nails is this kind of like name that he uh, publishes and exhibits and is on Instagram. But like Pettibone also, these are like things that he's like drawing and sketch, you know, like life sketches and things from magazine. And it's all kind of like collaged, but collaged by hand, if that makes sense. Like the drawings are, uh, I think Landgraf does that uh, sometimes too, where he's like collaging different elements that, you know, scales different, um, context is different and creating new things from it. Uh, I think like some of his Batman stuff is next if you want to keep going through them. Oh, we never found Batman's Lost in the Woods, do we? No, I have it, but I didn't scan it. Um, I didn't add it. I, so I should. I, found I, it, I, but I was lazy. Yeah. But yeah, time. same guy, but a completely different drawing style. This is like a lot looser, a lot. And I love this. This is like mm. just something so emotive about it and talking about kind of subversive appropriation and punk it's like you know these are two heroic characters and like a pretty non you know hero you know they're not even muscular they're just kind of like the you know they look like old men at the bar like the dive bar that you'd like not want to sit by i also like that there's a really like look at how batman is just a mass of these wild scribbles yeah but it goes hand in hand with him being really careful so it's like yeah, yeah, do the wild scribbles, let them dwindle off in from heavy to light almost kind of randomly, but they're also very carefully contained by this thin line. So it's a combination of letting yourself be messy and also having places where you, you're you very careful. Uh, Janelle Hessig, uh, so if, if you're not of age, don't read the comic, just look mm -hmm. at how She's showing different um, surfaces, different like you Good can. Save. Uh huh. Good save, Becky. <laughs> it's like I tell my niece and nephew: if you see anything that you're not supposed to see, just don't look at it. Just don't see like it. House, like looking through books. Um, but yeah, all these surfaces are rendered um, in very different ways. Like it's all pretty much the same line width. Like you can see the. Mm the wood grain versus uh, the hatching on the hoodie versus the countertop versus, you know, all these surfaces, you can tell that they're different surfaces because there's different patterns, even though they are used in a pretty flat way. Um, they're not in perspective, they're not, but, you know, easily differentiating. So that's another way to kind of like, you know, show atmosphere, you know, to show an environment without you know, doing, oh, I've got to do like perfect shadows. I've got to do perfect perspective. Like this she, is really, she really means it. It's not like she's somebody who said, well, I'm punk. I can do that. Like, I don't have to learn how to do things right. You can see where she didn't never, she doesn't care about certain things. It's a cartoon. It looks like a cartoon, but then she's so careful about the things yeah. that she chooses to value. Well, and, and that's, you know, that's the thing is it's not, um, you know, it's not about like, well, I just don't know any better, so I'm going to do it this way. You know, you make conscious decisions about what you're going to spend your time and energy on, um, you know, and, you, and how to communicate, um, yeah. how you want to show the world. And, uh, you know, as a cartoonist, as any kind of artist, you're not reproducing reality. You're making a symbol for what you're talking about. So you're always have this like, you know, not to like jump into like academia talk, like the discourse is always going to be, you know, in symbols, you're not, you know, trying to like show, you know, it's not a photograph. And so if you draw a coffee cup that looks like a coffee cup, you succeed, you can move on with your life, as far as I'm concerned. Like if people can tell it's a coffee cup. They can tell it's ass reamers, number six. <laughs> number five, I thought. Is this Uli Lust? Yeah, that's Uli Lust. Uh, and another good example of showing like flat blacks and kind of more 
controlled line work um, with these more expressionistic, you know, like the script, the scribble things up top in those panels, um, the way that the shadows are done, the way that like people's hair are done. So it's like, again, that same kind of push and pull between like control and looseness um, that you can get. Can you zoom in, Josh? Mm -hmm. It might not have been. Yeah, it's kind Tom, of Tom, do you know Oli? Leela, Leela knows her. I, I, I don't know her personally. What book is that? That's not a last day of your life. I'm not sure. I was grabbing stuff. Um, I had technical difficulties uh, getting uh, slides up. So I think it's it was, whatever it is, it looks like it's German. Yeah, I think it's originally published in German, right? That's um, Otto Dix, I think. It's an etching, but again, in the brutality, uh, still pretty punk. And it also, mm -hmm. like, some of the same line and patterns that we were talking about um, in earlier slides and earlier parts, um, like the feathering, cross hatching, the stippling, the kind of like wildness, the way that those flowers that they're laying on are almost kind of like childishly drawn versus okay. the attention to the folds and the uniforms and the medical staff that are like approaching this pile of like, you know, dead or decayed soldiers. It's so great. And almost, you know, these, the bits of stippling almost look like he just blew sand over the image, but still subtly kind of form a, a bit of a gradient. Looks like they're, well, maybe they're just getting mixed in with the crosshatch areas. Maybe they're- Yeah, they're, yeah. They're and it their, might be, um, depend, it might be bits of aqua tint uh, dropped in there too. Um, just a different way of like uh, making texture on an etching plate. Yeah. Here's another one uh, by him. I think that's a, that might be a reproduction of a, I can't remember if it's an etching or a reproduction of a painting that no longer exists. Mm. Another one uh, etching with some aqua tints and uh, some pretty light, like it's really abstract, but you can tell exactly what it is, but those are some pretty like wild and varied textures and but again, like controlled within those, you know, mal-shapen uh, rotting soldier heads. Same. I think that's an etching as well. There is a uh, George Grosch. Um, it's one of my favorite images by him. Uh, this touching scene of domestic abuse. But again, like talking about how you can totally tell there's, you know, perspective there doesn't exist. It's like a very mm -hmm. flattened space, but the same, a very well-defined space. And the way that it's kind of like flattened, kind of like it makes it seem more like a, a frozen moment, like the moment before like shit really gets real and kind of like gives the impression of this like exploded situation. And again, you see like, the edges um, of that kind of like feathered hatching that Josh was talking about um, at the edges of those figures. It's kind of like giving a very linear um, contoured image, like a little bit more depth and a little bit more punch. Yep. That's the, yeah, again, don't look at that if you're underage. Mm -hmm. um, talk about appropriation and Popeye and some compromising situations. Um, so Mexican engraver uh, Posado, who a lot of people are familiar with through his like skeletal uh, Day of the Dead imagery. But again, just these like kind of images of like violence and um, it's really aggressive and really graphic images. This guy's like very influential to a lot of people too. It's really interesting to me how these masters of, um, of lithographs and prints and uh, they always are very, Look how selective he is about when he uses cross hatching. Yeah. There's a ton of yeah, going back to talking about the restraint in those some of yeah. those comics. But... He has we has cross hatching that is right um, here on that guy's leg. And 
I saw it elsewhere. He kind of goes crazy up here in the crowd, but all the rest of this is just single hatch lines. These lines in her dress, it's almost like Venetian blinds, depending on how close he kind of draws them together. You can get a sense how the fold, the, the fold is kind of going in and kind of rising up. Yeah. So all of these lines, as much as it looks like this entire figure here is shaded, he actually did all of it with lines, mostly the lines going all the same direction on the arm and on the leg, they're all going towards like three o'clock. And then he has a different direction in the background. That's all he needs. Between those two points, he can say everything he needs to get all the tones that he needs to. Then it's it also, you've got to think that these have to be, these are inked and printed on uh, newsprint. Mm. So like a lot of the way that these look have to do with like the technical process involved in like making and printing them. Um, but it is like, you know, from the very earliest days of cartoons, like that's what it's about is you gotta be able to print this. Yeah. Whether it's yeah. offset lithography, whether it's um, engraved, you know, like metal engraving, typography, like actual ink has to go on this and print it in the newspaper, so. Are these wood cuts or lino cuts or what are these? Uh, I think these are metal engravings. Um, Even this one? Mm -hmm. huh. And so I think uh, like it would like um, the ink would be, I think it, like I'm not sure at this point like how they're printing, but it might be that the ink is going in the lines and then they're printing. I'd have to like, you know, re go go back 20 years to like my printmaking history and be like, how, how are newspapers printed at this point in time? <laughs> but yeah, this is same. Um, you can see kind of like where it's not printed very well, um, where like all of the ink didn't get on the paper for this. Oh, wow. Yeah, and there's another one. Uh, this is a, a space on this guy's name. It's a 20th century Mexican uh, printmaker. And this is, I think, a woodcut. But done uh, in that same tradition, but kind of like an anti-fascist uh, propaganda piece. Amazing how clear all this is. Yeah, and it, like, and punk posters, punk, like, it, you know, it's taken from this tradition of posters, of propaganda art, of appropriation, of these kind of, like, you know, using what you have to make this image, but also, like, you know, wanting, pe wanting to get a message out, you know, wanting to, you know, I want people to come to my show of my band that they've never heard of, so I need a cool poster. So we we put this, um, I downloaded this as a PDF, uh, both of the uh, P two PDFs that we're pulling from, and I put it in Dropbox. Tom, will people in the class be able to access the Dropbox? Yeah, I can put that link in the chat and also make sure maybe we do a, a follow up. We've got, I think we've got about 45 minutes left. Uh, so how much more do you want to spend on? Do you want to go through some of your slides? That... Keep, keep on going. I think we're going to come up on mine soon. And then I'll yeah, I, mean, I think we're almost done. So I'll just breeze through. Uh, it's a Goya, um, everybody's favorite atrocities of war. Um, another more print. I, I think like all I know is printmaking, like once I get past cartooning. So I'm yeah. going to talk when I. Um, when it's my turn, I'm going to talk a little bit about pointillism and yeah. how to incorporate pointillism with other approaches. Why don't you, um, yeah, let's feed through these real no, quick. No, 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 don't get, take your time. I'm just, there's plenty of time for it. I only need five minutes. Okay, go. Next slide. Cool. More, more of the same, more of that like real scratchy, frenetic uh, mark making inside a more controlled form. Um, you see that in like, several places using a little bit of atmospheric perspective um, on those bats where there's kind of like broken lines. Um, you can see as the bats get farther back, you're, you know, they're not as filled in. So that's another trick. Or is that you well, now? Well, yeah, it does not look at me if we, if we shave his head. Yes. <laughs> 
Let's go back to that though. Cool. Wow. Yeah, yeah this is the end. And this is um mm, so beautiful. More of the um kind of like de more design oriented. Like I was uh talking about some of the Jaime's stuff where you're very carefully using just like flat blacks and line work um, and maybe a few very like delicate areas of like hatching or detail, um, but just, yeah, like a just a different look, a different way things stand out. And I think the next one is my favorite one, but again, like if you're underage, don't look at it. You go to the next slide, Josh? Yeah, that's something's happening. One one sec. That's weird. It's not jam. Well, maybe it's for the better. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I can fix it real quick. Yeah, more and more, I'll talk while you're doing it. More and more, this is the kind of stuff that I look at. Um, both for it cuts down the amount of time that I spend rendering a page um, and I find that like a lot of the really delicate stuff that I used to do it doesn't translate as well in print anyway when you've got like a one by one panel so it's just a different way of like a different interest um whereas like maybe i used to cover it you know do more like uh janelle's stuff where like every surface is covered with some kind of mark um what are y'all seeing right now by the way you still seeing that same image no this is uh looks like one of the kirby pages maybe okay good good okay i'm just gonna go over here and i'm gonna show it on this device but something went wrong with my other computer and which is fine so yeah. we're here <laughs> oh yeah hey look at that that was actually the last one Awesome. Maybe I took out the. There's yeah. a lot of, like very large phalluses um, that I was into, but that's weird. Yeah. Um. Or maybe they maybe they got kind of pushed towards the back. Yeah, there they are. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't matter. We can. Oh, maybe like when you added the other stuff. Yep. But that, I mean, that's about all they are there that I had. So if you want to go on with yours um, that you wanted to show. Um, yeah, and I'm going to be flying blind a little bit, but let me go ahead and, uh, oh yeah, yeah. So, okay, so while, while Hyena was talking, I was continuing to work on, on this for good or for bad kind of went a little bit too far in places so i'm i ripped off that um i ripped off the technique of having that head looking up right here and this is going to be a memory of me buying like albums like um early and earlier in life me debating what's a better band you know or uh, maybe it's about like what what, I, what i'm going to spend my money on so i'm going to have uh different scenes and like Wait, Josh. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Who'd you rip that off? You said you ripped off the oh. looking up. So the one that I stuck when Hyena was talking and there was that shot that she said was used for a metal poster. And there was a woman who was kind of looking up and I was saying how much I liked the underside of the jaw. That's what I stole that from. Gotcha. I never draw jaws like this because I was taught by Phil Jimenez when I went to SDA. He showed me how when a head is looking back, you think that the jaw is going to go up, but it actually stays down. It's a bowl. And at best, as it goes up, you see a little bit of the under throat. If they look up all the way, maybe it becomes a level line. Unless the person has like a big Kirk Douglas chin, it actually, it, the line of the jaw doesn't really want to go from being a bowl to being a hill. So you can kind of leave it flat ways though because sometimes like it doesn't matter what's correct as long as it reads like oh this jaw is looking up yeah so this helped me because i was always stuck and i get stuck when when i went into this too eagerly but here's somebody who just doesn't care ben mara does this too he'll just i know he knows anatomy really well but he loves to do the up the throat shot 
it was actually kind of a trope in the 1940s, drawing the underside of the throat. When Batman's parents are killed, I think that's the shot. It's like the underside of the jaw as Thomas Wayne is shot by a mugger with the throat exposed. So there's something very, you know, kind of gothic about that. Uh, so that one I stole. We'll be right back. And I stole other techniques too. I stole these little veins. They got a little bit carried away with them, but initially I was really into that little vein technique. So again, like Becky said, yeah, do folds. Folds might look not this stylized, but if it works, it works. Or I'll do somebody back here. There's somebody back here who's looking for albums. There's a bunch of folds in their shirt. Awesome. This gives me a chance to do this kind of weird, weird vein shape, which is very appealing to draw. And it helps define that person and makes them look like an interesting shape. Now, I was going to talk about pointillism a little bit. Now, I don't know how many people here have ever said, well, I love, you know, we've all seen the effects where you want to show somebody's cheekbone and you see artists who are able to do it without line, but instead doing all with dots. I've always been really frustrated. I'm very ADD and I don't, I've never had the patience for this. And I found a technique recently after years and years of rejecting pointillism that actually helped me do it. And the technique is that, and, and there's some students in here uh, tonight who have taken my classes before. So they, they've all heard this, especially in the last couple months. What you do is you make the lines like a series of army, army ants. So ants walk in a very regimented way. Now I can, you can mix this with other types of shadow. I have a big black shadow here. If I wanna go around the throat, I can have straight lines that peter off into dots. The end of it, it looks like a field of dots, but instead of doing this, dot, 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 which is always feels, makes me feel like I'm going to go crazy. I do it like this, do a line, fade it out, do a line, fade it out, do a line, fade it out. And then you can go back and continue to work on it. So that's, that starts to draw your eye in. If I want to show the bone on the back of this character's hand, dot, dot, doing three or four dots, three or four dots, three or four dots, and that makes that bone just pop right out. And you want to, I mean, sometimes you need to have that variety. Like the reason this actually looks so much better before, but I got carried away with doing these lines and started to do them on this side as well and they stop working as effectively. So when you do too many of the same types of lines, you gotta shake it up a little bit. So looking at, while, while Hyena was talking, I stole this bit of feathering here. There was something that she's showing me about the, I think it was the woodcuts, uh, the Mexican woodcuts that I was borrowing to do the folds in this coat. And it feels pretty cohesive. It, feel, it feels like all of this imagery was done by the same person. Jason Lutz does lines like that sometimes, Josh. Oh, really? Yeah. Usually a long line and then a couple little skittering lines at the end of it. He did, is he, he did Berlin, right? Yeah. Oh, and let's talk about lettering a little bit too. So, you know, when I'm doing my sketchbook comics, I, I let myself, you know, you can see from some of the, this is how my lettering normally looks. So I draw like a, I write like a doctor, but lettering is kind of the secret weapon of how you do comics. Um, so I think my text here was, I liked a lot of 80s punk, but a lot of 90s punk spoke to me too. But a lot of, 90s punk spoke to me too. 
Now, when I was at SBA, um, David Mazzucchelli is my teacher and he was the one who told me the secret about doing world-class comic book, classic comic book lettering. And he said, you want your letters to be as um, uh, square as possible. So an E would be like this, a square, wide and tall in the same degree. An F is like that, a G is like that. Uh, the other thing I learned um, in Tom's class and in um, classes that, uh, classes that uh, kind of the consensus amongst the teachers was, you know, um, that when you want to do neat lettering, you use a, an AIMS guide. If you want, but most of us find the AIMS guide to be a real pain. So if you've used names guide, it's that little plastic tool has a wheel and you spin it. And I found it to be really hard to use, but instead I took away that what a names guide gives you are these brackets. I responded to 80s punk. So I've got a line of text here and I do a break and then a line of text. This is what a names guide sets up for you. Text, text bracket, space, text bracket, space. Then you neatly put in your lines and then you give yourself permission to either be very tight. You know, if you want, you can go in there and do the O and like stages instead of doing an O that's like 90s, one stroke, you can break down all these letters and do them in kind of out of order. And then you ask yourself, does the word punk here look noticeably different than lot? So I can do spoke like this. And all the time I'm trying to watch my tendency to get, you know, kind of meaninglessly big with the letters to me. I want, I want the two to be consistent with the B. The first letter I did and the last letter that I do should be consistent all the way through. And there's something about this lettering. I mean, it, it draws you in. So you can see here, I was doing these faster. This is how I work when I'm doing my actual graphic novels. So in contrast, like I'll do uh, before any other part on my page, I'll do the lettering. I'll do the lettering and then draw the bubble around it. And only then do I ink the uh, pencils just to make sure that I've got enough room and that it's not like, you know, but because it's like, if you don't have room, the way I see it is if I don't have room to put my speech bubble in there, then it's easier for me to tweak the drawing a little bit than like try to cram the letters in there and make somebody still be able to read them. And so I just do it a little bit different. You want a demo? Uh, I'll keep on going. Yeah, just keep going. I don't really, there's, I mean, there's nothing really to demo for me for that. Really? I don't think so. So when I, te when I teach people this to people, it takes them a while to get the hang of it. It is important that the letters go from, I think of these brackets as being like when you break your arm and you put it in traction, they're containing the letters. So the word R is going from the bottom to the ceiling. So I used to do this and I'd neat, try to net neatly or semi-neatly do a row of text. And then I would kind of underestimate how well my hand, how, even, how uh, my hand really wanted to do the letters. So I do a letter like this and then find out that, oops, when I do my letters, they actually don't go to the ceiling. They do go to the ceiling. It's a size I'm not comfortable with. So you redo it, bring this line down here, because you really do want to use the brackets, but what type of punk to, to really contain these, and these stay consistent. So line one, line two, line three are all the same height. And then the brackets between them bracket A and bracket B are also the same height, just a tiny little fraction. Then I might, depending on the mood that I'm in, I might go in and tighten up my lettering. 
making it a little bit more neat, or I might just wing it. So here, here I am going over the slightly neater lettering, and it's a little bit easier to see exactly, anticipate how exactly how the letters are going to work. Other times, I might just say, I can handle this. So even though the E is trespassing onto the O and I have to move it over, I'll just kind of freehand it. Something I've been doing lately is letting myself experiment with curving my E's, which I think is something that Art Spiegelman does. Um, the word is excellent. If I curve my E's, so it's like a C. Oops. Kind of speeds up the process a little bit. And I don't know that you're missing that much. Excellent with a round E as opposed to excellent with a square E. Then you can also, you know, depending on how OCD you want to get with your lettering, you can figure out how to, you know, you can look at lettering how-to books and you'll see there's certain letters like G's and S's that uh, you can actually do like out of order, like I was saying before, do the top, the middle, the bottom, and then connect them. Do the top, the middle, the bottom, the side, top, and then connect them. So it takes me five times as long, but maybe I get a letter which is a little bit, you know, a little bit better shaped. Same with the K. I could do a K like this, or I could do it like bringing the lines together and make sure that it's quote unquote perfect. Um, I want to try to do something. My, um, so my other computer where I'm like able to monitor the class is frozen, but you can still hear me. Um, I want to try to see if, may I should just leave it like this actually. Um, we're, we're at 9.30, right? And we're going to just go to 9.30. Um, and my one screen is frozen. What, what, uh, is there anything we didn't go over, how you know that we should? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I think it was just, we're going to go for, you know, see what, see what all fits in what time we got. Does anybody have any questions, technique questions or anything else? Oh, and uh, yeah, and it's being recorded. It is being recorded, yes. Um, Tom, do we want to put this on YouTube when we're done? Where can we see it? Uh... Oh, Tom's putting his little girl to bed. Yeah, well, yeah. Come here, what do you need? Oh, we we're just asking. Um, this is being recorded. Do you want? Do we want to upload it to YouTube when we're done? I'd be happy to do that. It's easy, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going back into the questions. Oh, okay, cool. You'll see the thing I said about John Porcellino and the Ames guide. Oh, what did he say about it? Oh, he said, every cartoonist should have an Ames lettering guide unopened in a drawer. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, they're, they're a nightmare. <laughs> I do, when I first started uh, doing comics um, seriously, I lettered like I wrote, which was this weird bastardized like mixture of upper and lower case. And I'm like, oh, this looks kind of cool. Um, and then years later, I'm like, wow, this is almost unreadable. Um, the end. <laughs> the end. Um, that habit of just like trailing, like it sounds like I have more to say when I don't. <laughs> so, local tick. So we can hang out and just like informally draw for a while. Maybe we go for like another. Uh, people can um, people can ask questions. They can mosey out without feeling like they have to stand on ceremony. Um, I could also show like screen share the black like the technique with black that I was talking about. This different from yours.
Mm. Ashin Hyena, you got a question in the chat about backgrounds too. Somebody's, I don't know if you want to go in and check it out. Oh, you want to read it? It says, I've always had a complex about backgrounds. I love how Tom Neely and Chester Gould and those folks get away with those kind of blank backgrounds. Any advice on backgrounds? And then somebody after that says, I can't stand lettering. Is there anything mentally you can yeah. use to get in the zone to letter and plan lettering? Yeah, the thing that really helped me with lettering was I read an interview with R. Crumb and he said that he liked lettering as much as drawing. And it made me re reframe how I looked at it. I don't, I won't say that I like lettering as much as drawing, but I do think it's a matter of, of I, think, I think it's a matter of perspective and like letting yourself enjoy it. Um, it just, it takes a couple other steps. I'd rather be drawing because it's pure imagination, but I did, there is something really satisfying about just putting lines down on paper. I, yeah, especially the, the uniformity of lettering um, is really calming to me. Like when you are able to get those like square letters one after another and like, like look at it and be like, yes, these are uniform, I, this is fine. But it like thinking of lettering the same as you would with drawing is kind of like how I approach it. Like as both in incorporating it into a drawing or into a comic um, that, you know, if you weren't making comics, if the words aren't important, then why are you making comic? You know, it's like, why are they even there? So just, um, you know, they're as precious as the drawing, they're saying just as much. So I give them just as much space and consideration, I think. My friend Jason worked at Fanographics for years and he told me he's had discussions with, um, with the, the staff there and they said that, uh, he had a quote from, I can't remember if it was from Gary or from Eric, but they said that lettering is a secret weapon in comics. It's like the, it's like the mortar that holds the bricks together. Yeah, there's, Gary a, okay, there's a composition question. Can I take that? Yeah, hit, hit it. Do you want to, you, and you can share your screen too. If you want to do what yeah, I'm doing. That's what I was trying to do. I just didn't want to like take it away from you. Yeah, um, if you want to share how you're drawing your page, you can. Just yeah, let yeah, me know. Yeah. yeah, let me know when you've done it so I know that I'm not sharing my screen anymore. Yeah, I'm about to do it. Doing it. All right. There we go. There we go. Okay, Is cool. It, are you still trapped in your uh all right? So let me get this chat window out of what I'm drawing, if I can figure it out. There we go. So somebody asked like tips on composition and laying things out. And as far as like laying out a page, and this is something that I want to take this question because it's something that like I think about more than any other part of comics probably is how to lay out a page as a composition and how the panels go together. And so say I've got, first of all, uh, you know, it's like I need like to be showing the action that I want to show. So that's the most important thing is not that I'm making like something that's, you know, really pretty or really um, works as a whole, but I need to be able to see. But okay, so how do I connect? these two panels, which like look nothing like one another. Um, one trick that I actually learned from Kirby and I'm not as much of a superhero um, or like traditional, I should not superhero, but I should say traditional comics person as uh, Josh is as far as what I've looked at and what I've studied. But he kind of has this way of making tangents in one panel that are like, you know, maybe unrelated. Maybe it's like a shadow meets the floor, but it's like these lines are touching and these lines are kind of like telling you that like, this is where you should be looking. And you might also put like a shadow there to kind of like 
reinforce that this character is like looking at this cup and then make another one coming down there. So it's like, you always want to draw attention to like what's gonna be the focal point. Um, another cool, see, so this, this one, let's see, yeah, maybe you could even make that coming down here and then have that connect to, I don't know, say like a diagonal shadow there. And this is something that's like kind of hard to show just without having anything that I'm trying to do with this comic. But it's a, using uh, diagonals, using um, tangents, um, there's tricks like, I'm trying to think, like, you know, kind of making things move along those axes. Um, let's see, how else could I do this? If I want to show that this guy's looking down here or that like something significant is gonna happen in this panel. And it's kind of like you start looking at how comics are connected in these ways and what I call like the infrastructure of them that you maybe don't see unless you're looking for it. And then once you see it, like you can't stop unseeing it. So I've got this shadow that this guy's like looking for something. This is drawing your attention to this. And then this shadow is drawing you back up to this guy, but also it'll end up pointing you down there. Um, so I don't know if that answers, is it related to making filmmaking cuts? I'm not a filmmaker, so I don't know. I've done storyboarding before. Um, we call this Rodchenko and filmmaking. Maybe, yeah, but <laughs> I don't know. Somebody's asking, where should we send our comics? Josh, do you want them to post them and tag them or send them to you or what do you want? Yeah, um, Dawn Unger just put that up and uh, that's exactly right. Hyena, you're, there's no underscores in your Instagram name, right? No, it's just straight up, Hyena, huh? Yeah, so you can do that, everybody. You can all, if you don't have Instagram, you can email them to um, my email, which I just put into the chat as well. Another thing that I would say about composition is looking, you can look outside of comics. You can study um, like classical paintings. You can study... Um, classical architecture and understand those kind of like basic rules of like why our eye is drawn to this or that or how things move around a page. That works for some, it works for me because I'm a system based person. Uh, it might not work for somebody else as well. I know, um, you know, I've known people that said like, I don't understand this. I just kind of like go intuitively and if it looks good, it looks good. So there's different, there's no right way to do it. I'm not drawing anymore, so I should start drawing, put my lettering here. That looks so awesome. Except I just, oh well. It's also punk when you like completely skip words and letters, like. <laughs> I don't think I've ever published something that didn't have at least one typo in it, and if, unless somebody like fixed it for me like some kind uh, publisher was like, oh man, this one again. I love the um, the last frame with the arrow, the kind of unconventional like eye directing arrow that goes right to the words why I'm punk. And this is kind of, after I said like, I always do the lettering that I didn't do the lettering first on this one, but. I wish I lettered this fast and like, my comic books, seems like it takes forever. So 
I was like reading all the comments. So this, <laughs> so this is shot assignment should fall between four and 89 panels. Yes. <laughs> Please make an entire graphic novel about why I'm punk. Are you reading from the chat? Yes. I don't know if I'm supposed to. Is chat private? This is, everyone can see this though, right? I'm not like breaking some kind of Zoom, uh, like a priest in confession, confidentiality. Hope not. Tips or tools to make even panel borders. Every time I try to make even ones, I have trouble. I would say for that, if it's keeping you from making comics, don't bother with it. Um, mm. Like if you're just getting into like, all right, I wanna make, you know, this 30 page comic, except I can't start because it's, you know, my, you know, board panels aren't going to look good. Um, then just forget about it because that's I. It's only been the past like three or four years that I've even bothered with ruling stuff out, and that was only because um, I was publishing it with somebody who needed me to do that, so I had to learn how to do it. Um, but I mean, I. Like I met, I don't have a fast way to do it. I measure it all out. Um, Strathmore, Bristol stopped having um, square pages. So you have to, if you're using that kind of Bristol, you have to go from one edge, if that makes sense. You can't like, you know, like you have to measure everything off of this edge because you can't trust that these are right angles. Um, yeah, so I just rule like measure and rule out every single page, I guess. You can also get gridded paper if you want to. You know, the more you struggle with it, the more it'll become. You'll find a a oh, around yeah, or a happy balance, or in struggling to try to make them straighter and trying to use every tool you can, you'll find a way where it gets a little bit easier. I'll, I'll share my own screen, so. This that I'm drawing on tonight is um, I have like a pad of like really subtly tightly gridded paper. I never use this though. I think I, I've experimented with every paper, including watercolor. Am I sharing? Yes, I think. Um, that's your comic, right? Yeah, that's my finger. So this is actually gridded, and I was able to both fold this and um, get a tight, you know, a tight line that way. Um, with my actual graphic novels, um, I have to, you know, they say like measure, measure twice, cut once. I have to measure like seven times. So I'll do systems like I will, if I'm really unsure about it, I'll actually do a line, take my ruler, put a mark on my ruler, slide it over and make sure this line, oops, actually, see, that's what I mean by how you have to measure multiple times. I already forgot to set, check whether I was right at the edge here. You can also, yeah, like use um... go over and make sure I'm, I'm really flush with the edge and that's my mark. So I was actually wrong the first time. Then I pencil it in and then I double check a couple more times and I still found it inexplicably when I'm done here. Sometimes it will um, still be slightly off. 
and I end up fixing it late in the game. But the point where I'm this close to it, I'm, I usually feel okay um, if I have to add on or adjust the information a little bit later. It's also pretty routine or regular for me that when I, um, uh, one second, let me find a page of my actual comic. So yeah, a T-square could totally work for that. You can also just use a triangle with your ruler um, if you don't have a T-square or if you have one of those annoying ones that doesn't lay flat. Um, so these I'm still fussing with. I also like here, you can see, I don't know what's happening here, but I'll resolve it later. But I go in with white out a lot because I'm like you, no matter, despite my best intentions, the inconsistencies will still come in. You can see how many times I went in here and I kind of slightly adjusted it. But it, in Photoshop, at the end of the process, I'll drag into Photoshop. It's really easy to fix that stuff then. Maybe I'll widen this entire margin. If this margin is that wide, I don't, I'm not missing any important information here. You also, yeah, you can also like do, you know, cut the page up, you know, in Photoshop or in real life and like glue it back down with like, you know, the measured uh, margins you want. And this one, I still have, I guess I haven't bit in the bullet and figured out how I want to do this kind of zigzaggy frame. So I actually have to sit down. And so I'm still it really late in my process. I'm still playing with this stuff and I'm okay with that. It, it's always really nerve wracking to actually go, the, the moment when you actually have to go in and commit and say, this is the line I'm gonna stick to. Especially, oops, cause I actually, see I accidentally made that a tiny bit wide there. Either this one's off or this one's off. But I can, like I said, I can shave, I can easily get in there in Photoshop and kind of shave this down or widen it depending on what um, the, the, you know, the rulers of Photoshop show me. So this is pretty, I'm not sure the person who asked this if you're used to Photoshop, but that is pretty, um, it's really easy to get in there even if you're just using your mouse and you're not using a special pencil to fix these things. I can wipe that out really easy. I can raise this. Um, yeah, so I also didn't do the bar at the top of that panel. So there's always like 5% of the borders that are left for the very last, the very end of the comic. You see, it's, uh, I do all mine, uh, <laughs> like I'll do all my borders and it, like before I even start penciling the comic, like I'll do all that. Talk about like type A. Oh yeah. Type totally. Step one, and now it's time for step two. There's so many things to worry about the borders, including that you can. Well, I, with the board, I would rather meticulously hand draw out every um, border than touch Photoshop. But that's uh, just you know that's my personal preference. Like I'd rather spend that time doing that than have to fix it later in Photoshop. There's also um, the factor, are you gonna ruin your pen you, using it with a ruler? I, I find that, you know, this is a, uh, this is a Kurataki, I actually just reordered these. We can talk about our pens a little bit too. Yeah, I, this pen, uh, I don't know if you can see it. Well, 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 this pen right there, I use only for borders because like they're a little bit more resilient to the metal blades of the rulers. So I've got these, and you can see it's a really beautiful pen. Can you hold that and, up again, Hyena? I'm sorry. Could you hold that this, up again? This one? Oh, this, uh, this is a Kurataki. Um, mm. I, I've never gotten them in not Japan, all Japanese writing, so I don't know what the... <laughs> okay, thank but you. This is medium. Uh, it's got a... Where's my camera? There it is. It's got a somewhat flexible felt tip, um, but it's a little bit harder than a lot of brush pens. Thank you. But it's, um, yeah, I, I can do like 24, mm, no, probably more like six to 12 pages with, and then it's like shot of just borders. So. Mm. 
can't, I, yeah, I didn't get a chance to see it. Could you hold it up again for a second? Yeah, and, um, oh yeah, yeah, those things. Yeah. I don't like drawing with them because it seems like the tips blow out. Um, but like when you're doing borders, you're kind of using more of the side of the pen. Um, so it's weird. They're like, hold up better against rulers, but I don't, it seems like if I'm trying to draw with them, I wreck them uh, really quick. Oh, um, somebody asked about backgrounds too. So, well, who was that? Are they still here? Oh no. I'm still sharing, right? I think so. Somebody was asking about, about backgrounds and so was I, Josh, it's Jan. Hey Jan, so. Yeah, I mean, you normally want to establish a background. Like this couch does a lot for giving you a sense that this is in a living room. But that means I can get away with panels where there's no information. So a lot of times there's not room for information. You can get into abstract kind of shapes. So a lot of putting a background into somebody's head, a lot of it is projection. You've established a space, like I established the bedroom here. And then I can get away with, you know, there's gonna be a lot of shots where you just don't have room to do the background. And it's distracting if you do the background. It's distracting to the viewer if you're constantly like, I need to put this in the background just because it's there. It's distracting to you as an artist, like if you're constantly worrying about, you know, when it doesn't matter, when you might see like a tiny corner of it. Um, so, but yeah, like establishing shot and then you're good. <laughs> Then you can just do little hints of it with shadow. Most comics that you look at where you feel like the artist was really doing their job of setting up a background, um, there's usually one, just small little key details of the architecture. Establishing shot, city, and then look how much of the scene is mostly faces and just a couple of corners of walls. And again, like you can get away without having to lay down. Um, oh, that's that first. Uh, yeah. Yeah, oh, I love that comic. I think it's yours. And I think you traded. I think you had a couple trades that I hadn't read and you were like, can I take this? So this one here, nice overhead shot. They did the bureau, they did a painting on the wall. Then you can get away with a lot of, I'm just gonna draw these curtains to show the space. Leave, one out, leave two of them out. This obviously saves a lot of time. And this is obviously a lot more, a lot easier to draw than doing a lot of careful perspective. He always does it. So this, you don't feel like you're missing anything here, like that you're being cheated of any details, but there is usually just enough of an environment to place the thing, to place the idea in your head that and, you're in the space. And doing comics is, you know, like sometimes it's about economy, especially if you're not, um, you know, maybe you're doing like a 200 page graphic novel that you're like, every single page of this is going to be like the best drawing I've ever done. And it's going to be so much detail. Um, but most of the time, I think it's like, okay, I, I need to finish this for this deadline. And then I want to do this book. So I want to get through this. Um, and it's about learning to say as much with doing less work, if that makes sense. Luis Real, I mean, this is my all time favorite comics. It's a little bit like what we're saying about the Mexican lithograph we're looking at. It's the restraint. It's he, really he, great. he wants to do cross hatching and he saves it. He only does one single corner. If you look carefully, you can see there's only cross hatching way up in the corner and a little bit here. And he knows what he's doing, and he repeats that triangle in every frame. This, all you need for this scene to show these behind a prison door is the door. All you need here is the window. He walks into the space, and all of a sudden, there's a black background. So the person who was talking about Jim Rugg using no backgrounds, I bet if you go back and look at it, it's usually after he's established a, um, Sorry, I use my cats like uh, <laughs> <laughs> establish the space. Such a great comment. Oh, okay. And so 
going back to this one. After this, we we'll probably wrap up, right? Yeah, I think it's 10, which is. Yeah, no way it didn't be. Roundabout's my bedtime. <laughs> um, I'm so punk, I have a bedtime. <laughs> I get up at like five in the morning though. I think I should get points for that. Do you get lots of points? It's all about points. Oh, here it is. It's right here. Um, yeah, so you know, Becky's composition choices. Um uh, you know, she was talking about how she weighs out a page. What I've been doing, it goes back to the first thing I was talking about tonight. It's about the big heavy blacks to help anchor things in space. So especially lately, I've been going in and putting in big aggressive areas of black i often will put the back arm and the back leg in shadow you part of you feels like you're cheating but at the end of it every time i put another mark down here it just makes the image stronger there's something about this big simple isn't black wally, leg. Uh, isn't that a wally wood quote like when in doubt black it out yeah back arm Occasionally, I'll go too far. But you, I, what I spend a lot of time doing is going back into my pages and adding the blacks after the fact. I added this big black way after the fact. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll do the op where it's like, I'll draw it out. Like, if I don't know exactly where all the blacks are going when I start inking a panel, there's like a 75% chance that I'm gonna fuck it up. Wow. Like that I'm gonna like go too far or, I mean, you can never fuck it up by not doing enough because then you can go back later. But um, yeah, if I don't plan ahead of time and I'm like, oh, I'm so good at this. I'm just gonna like, yeah, I know exactly what I'm doing. And that's when I make, um that's why i fucked it up well on that note everybody, <laughs> everybody thank you so much this is fun um yeah uh like i said spend your you know spend a week or something on these pieces and it's uh, whenever you finish them we'll post them for you um I'll, they'll go on my teaching page and if you don't have instagram and you want to email them to me uh you can do that as well yeah thanks everybody for come in to listen and watch and um, happy drawing i hope everybody got something out of it that they can take and make comics with thank you everybody right, okay good night. i'm gonna me too awkwardly fumble around while i figure out how to leave oh, wait that red button that says leave bye friends bye friends <laughs>